start the recording. We are honored to have with us tonight uh, Dr. Howard Weinstein. He is a pulmonologist in Greenwood Village, Colorado. Uh, he's been in practice for, uh, <clears throat> let's say he's very, very experienced. That's supposed to get a laugh. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> He's a graduate of the University of Buffalo Medical School. He did his internship at the University of Cincinnati, his residency at the University of Wisconsin, and his fellowship at infectious disease at the University of Kansas. He is board certified in internal medicine in, and, and, and pulmonary disease. And I don't know if you know, but he recently published a treatise called How My Malkatunum Wrote Me Into Doing a Seminar. <laughs> Big seller. <laughs> They'll be available, I think, on Amazon right now. Correct, doctor? Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And I'd like to uh, thank the Federation for inviting me to share some pertinent and timely information on a topic that um, also presents us with uh, difficult moral and ethical issues. Uh, you heard a bit of my biography, but let me fill you in since most of you don't know what I'm doing anymore. Um, I'm not sure what I'm doing anymore either, besides being retired and living through COVID every day is uh, who know what days. But uh, I've been uh, retired for a little over three and a half years now. And for approximately 40 years prior to retiring, I uh, was in a private practice of pulmonary disease and critical care medicine uh, in Los Angeles, and then more recently in the Denver, Colorado area. Um, most of my time was spent working in um, hospitals and in intensive care units. And since I retired, I have been an active member of the ethics committee at the hospital where I uh, last, last worked. Uh, let, me, let me make two disclaimers first. One, first, I'm uh, not trained as a ethicist and I'm not certified as a medical ethicist. And secondly, as will be uh, apparent later, I'm not uh, extensively educated in nor knowledgeable of Torah, Talmud, or Rabbinic Judaism. And my interest in medical ethics actually is more of a hobby than anything else. So let me see if I can do this and share my screen and you can tell me if it's uh, come on okay. Hopefully it is. Good, okay. Um, with that said, uh, the topic for this evening is ethical considerations in uh, triage, rationing, and reallocation of scarce medical resources during a pandemic. Um, as, we, as we go along, if anybody has any uh, comments or questions, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get them uh, answered and, uh, a little bit later on. Um, also, if anybody should happen to want the slides from uh, this presentation, I'd be happy to send it to you. My email address is on the bottom of this slide and you can just uh, email me your e email address and I'll be happy to send it to you. So when, when uh, SARS-CoV-2 or what's commonly referred to as COVID-19 first appeared at the beginning of 2020, uh, or probably more accurately towards the end of last year, uh, I read some of the early articles and got the feeling that this was going to be more than just a common cold or mild flu-like illness. And the reasons for this were that the virus spread so quickly and appeared to be highly contagious and extremely vir virulent. Uh, from the beginning, there was evidence that the main target of the virus once it entered our uh, bodies was the lungs. And due to the rapid increase in the number of cases and the speed by which people became infected, the medical community was, uh, was quite concerned that the healthcare system would be overwhelmed and that there would be a shortage of mechanical ventilators as well as other resources uh, to care for these uh, very ill individuals. As a result, um, the talk of needing to, to triage, ration, and possibly reallocate these scarce sources arose. Uh, fortunately, through physical and social distancing, sheltering in place, uh, wearing masks, uh, good hygiene, especially hand washing, uh, closing down the economy, and uh, retooling some of our country's manufacturing uh, capabilities, we were able to flatten the curve, as, so to speak, 
and uh, for the most part avoid uh, the worst scenarios and dodge the bullet that could have developed with uh, a massive and rapid surge in the number of cases. And we did, this was done by reducing the number of cases or the spike in number of cases and spreading them out over a longer period of time. Unfortunately, is not, as is not unusual uh, in this country when potential issues seem to be on the decline or resolving, uh, they are often placed on the back burner and we move on to other issues without solving the initial problem. And as we are all witnessing now, another uptick in cases and some of the initial problems which were of concern have reappeared and we still do not have a consistent universal or national guideline in place of how to deal with these scarce resources. So in May of this year, let's see, let me advance this, let me advance this. Uh, there we go. So in May of this year, um, I was asked to present a program as part of the continuing education uh, requirements of our ethics committee in the, at the hospital where I'm still a member pertaining to the ethical in, issues uh, involved in triage rationing and reallocation. So I turned to the internet and searched the, nicks, the nooks and crannies of the internet to see what I can find and look through some of the current medical uh, literature that appeared in the journals that I still uh, try to keep up with. And I was surprised to find how much had been written in both medical and non-medical journals, as well as on social media and in printed media. Uh, besides the current discussions pertaining to COVID per se, numerous papers and statements going back probably 30 years, and especially over the last 15 to 20 years were available and discussed the issues of triage rationing and reallocation of limited resources during various disasters, not only uh, things like infections such as COVID-19, but also natural and man-made uh, disasters. So this article appeared first online in March of 2020 and then subsequently in print in May in the New England Journal of Medicine. And after reading it, I thought that this would be a good springboard to introduce the topic of scarce resources during disasters and some of the ethical issues the subjects present to us. And it would also offer us a chance to start a discussion on this, this topic. Uh, the article itself is available if you Google it, uh, put it into your search engine and um, you, you can get it. I think it's free and it's in the public domain if you're interested. The lead author is Emmanuel, or Ezekiel Emanuel, um, and he happens to be the brother of Rahm Emanuel, who I'm sure you'll recall as uh, an advisor to President Obama and subsequently mayor of uh, Chicago. He's currently a physician and ethicist at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. So some of you Philadelphians uh, might have a chance to hear or see him. He's been, he's been on um, the news a lot, um, especially on uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, reports of COVID uh, and ethical issues um, when this all first came on. Um, and he used uh, some ethical principles to create a, a framework for making six recommendations that we'll go over on how to uh, allocate these resources uh, in the time of COVID-19. When we talk about scarce resources, I sort of divided these up into three categories, places, persons, and things. And actually you could use this um, division and, and talk about scarce resources, not only for COVID, but for any other pandemic that might occur or any other disaster that might occur, occur by just tweaking some of the items under each of these three categories. But for COVID, the things that we've discussed um, that have been discussed include hospitals, hospital beds, and critical care beds, uh, personnel, including critical care and critical care nurses and physicians, respiratory therapists, those people that take care of uh, ventilators, 
other support personnel who are needed to maintain the infrastructure of hospitals. And these would be uh, pharmacists, dietitians, environmental service people, janitorial people, they're all necessary, especially to control infection within the hospital. And also first responders who um, have to go out and pick up people that um, uh, need to be brought into the hospital because they have not only COVID infections, but other medical conditions. What are the things that uh, could be scarce? And this is, these can be personal protective equipment or PPEs, which we hear so much about, face masks, shields, gowns and gloves, uh, medications and treatments, mechanical ventilators, uh, testing material and equipment. You can't have one without the other. You can have lots of testing material, but if you don't have the equipment to run it on, you can't put, analyze the tests. And if you don't have the equipment and you can have all the testing material, you can't analyze the material because there's no equipment. And finally, the vaccines. And we've all heard plenty about all of these uh, specific items. I'd like to just present four basic principles of medical ethics that I think are important uh, to, to understand. And um, they are something that we use when we are asked to do an ethical consultation in the hospital. And also, as you'll see, become important in um, Emmanuel and his group's paper. Uh, the first is beneficence, and that is to do good and preserve life. The second is non-maleficence or doing no harm. The third is autonomy, where each individual has decision-making capacity, has the right to have input into deciding what he or she may want in terms of defining his or her quality of life and the extent of medical care he or she will accept. And finally, social or distributive justice, which is the allocation of medical resources to do the most good for the most number of individuals. And I think if you just look at this in a superficial way, you can see how these might be defined differently by different people and under different situations. And these uh, four topics have been uh, topics for numerous medical conferences on medical ethical issues over the years and still are. So Emmanuel and his group uh, published this table in their article called Ethical Values to Guide Rationing of Absolutely Scarce healthcare resources in a COVID-19 pandemic. On the left side, they list the ethical values and guiding principles. And on the right side, they uh, list how they feel it applies to COVID the COVID-19 pandemic. And here again, you can see how these uh, reflect those four basic ethical principles um, that I just reviewed. Uh, firstly, they talk about maximizing benefits. And that could mean the saving of most lives or the most life years. And we'll talk about what the difference is here in a, in a moment. And this should be receiving the highest priority when you apply it to the COVID-19 pandemic. Secondly, uh, people should be treated equally. And how do you know, how do you ration or give limited or scarce resources to individuals? Is it on a first come first serve basis? or should it be on random selection? And Emmanuel's group rejects the first come first serve basis uh, and prefers to use a random selection for selecting among patients with similar prognosis who are vying for uh, the limited resource. They also suggest promoting um, and rewarding something called instrumental value. And this is um, rewarding people who uh, may be a benefit to others and have the ability to take care and save multiple lives. And you can look at this retrospectively by uh, identifying people who have done research studies uh, to help de de uh, develop medications or vaccinations and put themselves at risk. And also consider healthcare workers who over the years have put themselves in, uh, in danger by taking care of patients with uh, various infectious diseases. And uh, therefore they should be uh, prioritized when it comes to uh, receiving some of these resources because they may be able to save more lives in the future. And you can also look at this in a prospective way uh, by keeping healthcare workers well 
uh, not allowing them to get infection by whatever means that might be, and, and helping get them back to a functioning level so that they can go back to work and take care of patients again and again, uh, maximize the number of people that might be uh, benefit, benefited by their services. And the last uh, topic here is to treat the worst off. And that might mean tricking, treating the sickest first who need the limited resources versus treating the youngest first who are more likely to benefit by those resources. And if they recover from the, uh, the illness, they may be able to become immune and go out and, and uh, uh, stop spreading the spread of the virus. And if you look at these um, issues carefully, the values are not mutually consistent with each other or reconcilable in a, in a very easy manner. Uh, saving the most individual lives versus saving the most life years by giving priority to patients likely to survive after treatment may be competing ideals. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And priority to the worst off could be understood as giving priority to the sickest or the younger patients and uh, those who have lived the shortest if they die untreated. So you have to balance these uh, different issues uh, in the course of deciding who should get the treatment. And another concept that's important to understand is uh, the concept of standards of care. When you go to a physician's office or to a healthcare facility, you expect certain things to be followed. Uh, you expect certain treatments to be available. They should be applied in the proper way and they should be available to everybody that goes in for a care. And that's a standard of care. It may be different from one community to another, but there's still a, a standard that's, uh, that's defined by the community in which you live and guides the care that's being given. This requires some stewardship, however, when these cares, when this care is limited or scarce. And when this occurs, we call this the crisis of standards of care. Somebody has to be there to declare that there is a crisis, and then someone or a team has to implement guidelines which hopefully have been developed uh, that can be applied to this crisis of standards of care. And unfortunately, there is no national standard, and this has been relegated to uh, regional, state, or local jurisdic jurisdictions. And not all of these, uh, these different places um, have been compliant or have taken the initiative to develop guidelines and have them available put to, to put into place when necessary. And that's what we're seeing right now. With the resurgence of uh, COVID in certain states, they had no guidelines and they weren't prepared for this. And as a result, they've had a recurrence of, of a crisis of, of limitations and scarcity of certain resources. Before these, this crisis of standard of care guideline is, is um, implemented though, there must be clearly an absolute scarcity of resources. It's preferable that there is a resource, te resource team or a triage team rather than individual triage officers to implement this, um, uh, these guidelines on an individual basis and, and in an individual institution. And it's felt that the triage team should be independent from those caring directly for patients. It puts uh, physicians who have an oath to care for each individual patient and provide the most positive care and cultural care um, and, uh, and re respect each individual patient into a position where they have to make decisions about who is going to receive the care. So it's a difficult ethical en entity for the the bedside physician and therefore it should be, they should be removed from having to make those decisions and it should be placed in a triage team. Uh, nevertheless, um, the bedside physician, physician could be uh, available for providing information to the triage team itself. Then the policy, the triage policy uh, and guidelines should be applied consistently and objectively and there should be validated and objective criteria that can be used. And indeed there is uh, validated and objective criteria which, which determines prognosis and independent uh, patient care and, um, and can be applied and are used in some of the guidelines that have been adopted in various places. 
So what are uh, the recommendations that, uh, that um, Emmanuel and his group have made? And the, uh, they list some those numbers one through six. I put some captions on them to sort of get a, um, uh, uh, an idea of what each recommendation is talking about. And the first uh, recommendation that they put forward is to maximize benefits. And here they want to emphasize and balance population outcomes, which is a utilitarian ethical perspective, and the value of each human life, which is not a utilitarian perspective, but is typically a Jewish perspective. Each individual life is important, and the population is secondary to the value of each individual life. Um, the decisions must balance saving more lives against more years of life in a consistent way. And what this might mean is that, let's say you can save the lives of 10 people and they live one year, but you can save the lives of two people and they each live 40 years and go on to, to um, uh, um, uh, produce very important social and societal inputs um, in, in the fields of science, education, uh, um, uh, medical care and so on. Um, so how do you balance saving more lives versus saving more years of lives? In the first case, you would save 10 years of life. In the second case, you, see, you save 80 years of life. In the first case, you save 10 lives. In the latter case, you'd save two lives. Difficult to balance those two issues. Then you want to prioritize the maximizing number of patients who survive treatment with a reasonable life expectancy over the length of life. And here again, there's a difficulty in balancing these two things. If you save a patient and that patient can function for five years and, be, and contribute to society, but you saved another patient that may be able to survive 10 or 20 years, but they, they are in a, in a nursing home, in a dependent situation, they can't function in society, does one have more priority over the other? Another difficult topic to consider. Uh, you wanna, of course, prioritize the sick who are likely to recover, but does that mean that if you have a limited resource and the patient that comes in is a younger patient who's more likely to survive with the treatment versus an older patient, and they both have the same prognosis, who should get the resource? Should it be the younger person who's more likely to benefit or the older person who may not benefit even though they have the same degree of sickness? They uh, recommend avoiding considering quality of life and quality of adjusted life years um, as being a, a, a consideration. Uh, for example, you know, I might be sitting here and saying, hey, you know, I'm an active person. I like to be out. And if, if Saving my life would put me in a, in a nursing home in a rocking chair and watching television 24 seven. I'm not sure that quality of life would be good for me. Now you can ask me 10 years ago, 10 years from now, if that would be a quality of life and I may change my mind. Or the person next to me, like my wife, may say I'm perfectly fine sitting in a rocking chair and watching television. So that's a very interesting judgment call about uh, you know, what quality life really might be. Uh, in the same regard, they encourage the use of advanced directives, something that um, is, is something that we all probably should have nowadays, which uh, uh, tells you what tells other people, including those that will make decisions for you if you are unable, uh, what your impression of quality of life and what kind of care you you may want. And of course, this brings up the issue of allocation of, of scarce resources. And uh, Emmanuel and his group came out with this statement when it comes to reallocating sources, resources. And they believe that removing a patient from a ventilator or an ICU bed to provide it to others in need is also justifiable, um, presumably because the second patient will have a more likely chance of survival or that the first patient is not doing well with the therapy. But patients should be made aware of this possibility at admission. So when they come into the hospital and there is a crisis of care and they know that they're scarce, um, 
resources, that this might be something that they're going to have to deal with sometime in the future of, of their, uh, their care. The second recommendation is regarding real, or allocation of the resources. And here they, they say frontline workers put themselves at risk. And this would include uh, first responders and critical care uh, nurses and physicians. And frontline healthcare workers and those who keep critical areas functioning should be the first to receive these limited resources. And this is based on a concept called instrumental value in a pandemic. It doesn't have anything to do with the worthiness of the individual. I mean, the individual may be somebody that you wouldn't want to, you know, meet on the street or have a dinner with, but these are individuals who may be essential to the pandemic response and are also necessary to care for those who are ill from non-pandemic causes. You have to remember that there's other illnesses that are still in the community that, um, that are occurring and that people need to be available who can take care of those uh, who, who suffer from these other illness, illnesses and not just those that suffer from the pandemic. And of course you want to prioritize uh, this based on factors other than wealth, fame, or political power. Um, good luck on some of those. Third recommendation is equality. And here's where he gets into the concept of um, random allocation uh, versus uh, first come first serve allocation of, of uh, scarce resources. And they feel that, that random allocation is a better way to um, decide who gets the resource if the prognosis of two individuals are the same. They feel that the first come first serve unfairly benefits those in li living close to healthcare facilities and resources. If you live in an area where there's good hospital, good medical resources, and easy access from first responders, you're likely to get to that hospital before somebody in an underserved area or in a rural area. And they feel that the random allocation might be a better way to address this issue. They also feel that random allocation provides fairness to those who get sicker later because they follow public health measures versus those that are not following these public health measures. If you're staying at home, social and physically distancing yourself, sheltering in place, wearing masks, washing your hands, staying at home if you get a sniffle, um, and therefore don't go to the hospital right away, but somebody who's been to political rallies, a concert, the beach, a bar, and they get a sniffle and go to the hospital, maybe the person who has followed the rules should get preference and be prioritized over those who did not follow the public health care measures. An interesting concept. Also, if, you, if, if and when medications and vaccines become available and they are scarce, you can see what kind of havoc this might create if you have a first come first serve uh, distribution in these, uh, these uh, modalities. Um, a clinic opens up, they have 200 doses of vaccination and 500 people show up. There's gonna be a fight at who's gonna be first in line for these, uh, these scarce resources. So they feel random allocation might be a better way to go in that regard. Next, you have to be flexible. As we all know that when COVID first came about, um, we didn't know a whole, whole lot about it. And since then we've learned a lot more and the scientific evidence has changed over the course of time. Uh, masks were first felt, excuse me, felt not to be effective. And now all of a sudden everybody wants to wear, well, most everybody wants to uh, recommend wearing masks. Um, you know, everybody that got sick and went into respiratory failure went on an, uh, a ventilator, but we've learned that some people could be treated by using something called prone position positioning where they were placed on their stomach and use alternative ways of delivering oxygen. Um, so this has changed and, and developed over the course of the, um, at least the eight months or so that we've seen COVID. You gotta recall that ICU beds and ventilators and other treatments are not preventative, but are hopefully curative. So when you allocate, they should consider prognosis based on things like age, comorbid conditions, and severity of illness, among other things, 
to be able to maximize benefit. And there may be changing uh, recommendations based on uh, factors that we learn as this disease becomes better understood over the course of time. Here you have to be flexible and use epidemiologic modeling to set priorities for testing in order to target treatment, including vaccination, and maximize the benefit so as to reduce viral spread and the risk to others. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy in these epidemiological modeling uh, modalities, um, and they've changed. They've changed as we've gotten more results from testing, um, as we've understood the disease and how it um, uh, presents itself and responds. So these epidemiologic uh, modeling uh, uh, um, protocols change with the course of time, and you have to be flexible and be able to change. And it's not because the data is bad or insignificant or we don't know what we're doing. It's because the data keeps changing and you have to understand that. Uh, another example of being flexible is who gets the vaccines? And I think the general consensus right now is that they should be prioritized first to healthcare workers and first responders with the goal of maximizing lives. And then you have to decide whether you're gonna give it to older persons and those with chronic conditions who are more likely to die versus younger individuals who generally do not get as sick, but if they're immunized and develop immunity, they are less likely to spread the infection. Uh, recommendation number five has to do with research. We briefly mentioned that before. People who volunteer for studies to prove the safety and effectiveness of vaccines and therapeutics expose themselves to unknown risks. And these people should receive some priority um, for the limited resource, but only if there's a tiebreaker with somebody with sim similar prognosis. And finally, uh, non-discrimination. Uh, there should be no difference in allocation of scarce resources between patients with COVID-19 and those with other medical conditions. People are still having heart attacks, strokes, developing cancer, are involved in traffic accidents and other types of trauma. And they also are, are um, uh, uh, competing for these scarce resources and they have equal, should have equal access to these resources in a manner similar to anybody with COVID uh, that is appearing in an emergency department and, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, trying to make themselves, um, get themselves treated by the limited resource. So basically that's what Emmanuel um, had to say in, in his group's article. Uh, but needless to say, as you can think about some of these, uh, these recommendations, he put himself on a slippery slope. Um, there are many people that would not agree with some of his recommendations and conclusions for various reasons. And a number of editorials and letters to the editors of medical journals, as well as lay journals and in public media, uh, express concern about, um, about his conclusions from ethical, medical, scientific, uh, uh, philosophic, uh, theologic, um, uh, and uh, societal uh, um, positions. And um, I looked at various of these uh, responses, and there were so many coming came from so many different directions. I thought, given the audience here, that maybe it would be interesting to look at what the Jewish perspective uh, um, and in this um, uh, to this article might have been. And indeed, I looked at some of the different denominations of Judaism, and they each had different perspective sets to um, what they um, uh, felt were appropriate ethical considerations. And even within each denomination, there were differences of opinion. So I focused down, I focused down more closely on what the um, conservative Jewish movement had to say about this. And indeed, there was an article that was uh, I, I found online. I'm sure it's been written somewhere, but I couldn't uh, exactly find where that source is. But you can uh, search for this article, Triage in the Time of a Pandemic. It was written by Rabbi Elliot Dorf and published, interestingly, on March 30th, 2020, which is just about the time Emmanuel's article first appeared online. 
Dr. Rabbi Dorf is a well-known medical ethicist, published a lot on Jewish medical ethics and death and dying from a Jewish perspective. He is professor in philosophy at the American Jewish University in Los Angeles, and also the chair of the Conservative Movement's Committee on Jewish Law and Standards of the Rabbinic Assembly, which uh, itself provides guidance in matters of halakha for the conservative movement. And he presents a number of points, most of which I think agree in general with uh, uh, Dr. Emanuel's group. Um, but he prefaces this in his introduction with, with some comments that I excerpted and I thought are interesting um, and show how difficult this is from a Jewish perspective and an ethical and moral perspective. And he comments that this is a whole paradigm shift from a patient-centered focus with with the concept of pekuach nefesh, or safeguarding the individual life, which is typically a Jewish uh, perspective, to a public health perspective, or saving as many people as possible in the time of a pandemic where resources are scarce. And the uh, emphasis here has to be on saving those who have the best chance of survival, uh, which is a little bit different than, than uh, proceeding to look at each individual um, in, its own, in his or her own right. And then just to quote him directly, he states that, furthermore, I have no doubt that people trying to apply the Jewish tradition to these decisions will also disagree with each other. That said, this is how I, with a deep sense of the gravity of what I am about to write, and even a deeper sense of humility in even addressing these triage issues would say. So, you know, he's having a hard time dealing with this in a in a Judaic and a, in an ethical manner. But what are some of his comments? Well, he agrees uh, that triage protocols should be instituted and initiated, but only when there is definitely a shortage of uh, medical personnel and materials. He also agrees that triage decisions should not be made by physicians caring for any given patient or patients, but rather by an independent triage officer or team. He tries to get around the issue of utilitarianism by using the endpoint of maximizing the number of patients who will survive to hospital discharge in a state at least equal to that before acquiring COVID-19. And he says that this focuses not on life years saved, which favors the young or those who might be a benefit to society, but saving as many lives as possible. And he uses the arbitrary endpoint as a hospital discharge in a state equal to that before acquiring COVID-19. Uh, regarding the issue of triage, rationing, and reallocation, Rabbi Dorf says that some patients who would ordinarily receive and benefit from treatment may either not receive treatment, have the initiation of treatment postponed, or have treatment discontinued, and as a result may die or suffer some other adverse health-related consequences, and he says this is a tragedy of the necessity to triage when, scare, when resources are scarce. And he also states that triage decisions apply both to withholding and withdrawing limited medical resources. In triage conditions, using scarce medical resources on individual patients must be reevaluated on an ongoing basis and may result in reallocating life support from one patient for use on another. It's rather bold statements from, statement, I think, from a, from a Jewish perspective. Um, he also believes that COVID and non-COVID patients should be treated in the same way without discrimination, although he does say that age may be considered if it's relevant to the chance of survival. For us old people, that's a little troubling, I think. Um, he also uh, advises the use of advanced advanced directives and that these should be respected. He brings up the concept, the concept of futility of care, which is a topic that can be discussed uh, in and of itself because futility has been defined differently by different people. Uh, clearly, if somebody is not expected to benefit uh, and has no chance of survival, it's pretty simple. But um, uh, otherwise, futility can be defined in different ways. Uh, he advocates that healthcare personnel should have a preference to the limited resource 
but only if they have a good chance of recovering and to returning to work. And indeed, we don't know how many healthcare workers may get COVID and how many of them may not be able to return to work. It's not real clear at this point in time. Some of them just can't because they're too sick and unable to uh, get back to um, the hospital. He adds a, a preference to pregnant women in the last one or two months of pregnancy with a viable fetus because two or more lives could be saved by saving the mother in this case, something that I, I don't believe was, uh, was commented upon in Emmanuel's paper. Um, he agrees to the use of a lottery to choose who gets a scarce resource if there is uh, uh, a tie in terms of prognosis. And he says, states that this invokes the principle of Jewish law that we are each created equal in the image of God. But it, this also requires periodic evaluation of progress and prognosis of those receiving the scarce resource. And if somebody is not able to be cured, then palliative care and comfort care should be provided. And this was something that uh, Emmanuel and his group also mentioned. Well, so now, now, now we might think that we're on some firm footing as far as the conservative movement is concerned. We have some guidelines, but lo and behold, there was no unanimity in the conservative movement uh, about this. And there was um, some, some conflict between the, the rabbis uh, in the conservative movement. And the main article that was written is this one here by Rabbi Daniel Nevins uh, called Triage and the, Sanct and the Sanctity of Life. Uh, Rabbi Nevins um, is the Dean of the Rabbinic School and the Dean of the Division of Religious Leadership at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. And he offered a different approach by asking this question, on what basis should a medical professional determine which patient gets life-sustaining treatment in a pandemic emergency setting? And he presents some, some um, uh, rebuttal to uh, Rabbi Dorf and uh, Dr. Uh, Emanuel's comments. And this is just some of the ones that I, I pulled out of this article. And this, this article you can find also online if you uh, put it into your browser. Lotteries may not save the most lives. For example, patient A wins the lottery, he dies. Maybe patient, patient B would have survived if he got the treatment. Do we know who is who in this regard, even though the two of them may have the same prognosis at the time the lottery is made. And it truly is there equality. In a crisis, perhaps a physician or critical care nurse may be more valuable if treated since he or she could save more lives. What about giving priority to the worst off? That might not yield the greatest utility. For example, two patient, patients come in at the same time, they both have the same prognosis based on uh, criteria that are uh, uh, available. But person A is the homeless guy, the alcoholic, the drug addict down the street, and patient B may be uh, Albert Einstein. Mm. But they both have the same prognosis. If you go to a lottery, uh, maybe patient A would win. Uh, maybe we should give priority to some, the second person because they may have a, a greater utility in terms of what they can provide to society. And maximizing ben benefits don't uh, always uh, proceed on the basis of justice and fairness um, because uh, justice and fairness may not apply when you're looking to maximize the, the benefits and, you're, and some people have more uh, utility than others. And again, what is the likelihood or unlikelihood of survival? Is 50-50 a good chance of survival or is it 60-40, 70-30? And how do you decide um, what numbers to use? And what is recovery? Is recovery uh, surviving till you leave the hospital? Is it recovery till you get back into society and, all, and can uh, resume your life? Is survival one year, five years, 10 years? Those are arbitrary and not clear. Uh, he is concerned also that medical workers might not have uh, the right to have uh, priority because they inherently accepted, uh, they, they accept an inherently risky work. And the same may be true somebody who volunteers for a research study. Um, it's sort of like a, somebody decides to, to volunteer for the, 
for the military and, and finds that he's put on the front line and might get shot. You know, if you volunteer for, for doing this kind of work, then you put yourself in an in a inherently risky position. He's also concerned that people with disabilities or chronic health care conditions could be discriminated against uh, by those who have a better overall health or younger age because the former may require more resources either to get through the illness or after they survive the illness. He also mentions that those being treated with a potentially beneficial treatment could be bumped for those in whom treatment could possibly be more beneficial. And who has the absolute knowledge to make that decision and who will perform the act of ter terminating the care? And he takes you back to the person who switches the switch in the electric chair, or cuts the noose uh, loose on a, on, a, on a hanging or guillotine uh, that has the black mask over his face, you know. Um, is it the triage officer? Is it the triage team? And who's going to do the termination act? Um, and again, we, we don't want the bedside care provider to be the one to do this. Tria is concerned also about triage officer or committees having too much power in terminating treatment, even in non-terminally ill patients without consent. And many of these guidelines say that in a, in a crisis of care, you do not need the consent of the person or his uh, proxy uh, to terminate care. And that presents a lot of ego and moral issues um, when we talk about um, having visibility in crisis of care situations. Regarding triage rationing and reallocation, and this is a direct qu quote from uh, Rabbi Nevins, it seems to me that Jewish law does not permit the removal of life-saving equipment from patient A in order to save the life of patient B, unless patient A or their proxy requests cessation of ventilation due to the suffering caused by their extended illness or the, in the event that patient A is determined to be terminally ill, and he arbitrarily, arbitrarily states that this is expectation to die within one year with or, at the, with or without the use of the ventilator. And as, as a result of this, he disagrees with uh, Dr. Emanuel and Rabbi Dorf, as well as, as others who have written on this subject. Finally, he lists a few halachic rules um, and, and all these articles have been well referenced, especially uh, Dr. Uh, Rabbi uh, Dorf and Rabbi Nevins in terms of Torah, Talmud, and rabbinic rulings in the past. But Rabbi uh, Nevins lists a couple of halachic rules. Uh, one life may not be sacrificed for another or possibly in the effort to save the many. And I think we all probably have heard stories and, uh, about this. Halachic literature suggests the patient in greater danger should have, prior, should have priority over one in possible danger. But with COVID-19, we do not yet know how to define which patient is which. We don't always know who is going to survive. Indeed, a, a study came out recently that uh, of 35% of, of the patient, patients in an ICU die within the first 28 days of their being in the ICU. But that means 65% of the patients survive longer uh, than those 28 days. So do we know how to define who's gonna be the survivor and who isn't? Prioritization is not always clear and there are conflicting rabbinic and ethical conflicts, including the arbitrary likelihood of surviving one year. And finally, he says, transferring care from a terminally ill patient to a viable patient is acceptable, but transferring care from one potentially a viable patient to another is a whole different story. So you can see the conflict that, that's here, even in the conservative movement by two rabbis who uh, respect each other. And how did the conservative movement balance now the slippery slope from the uh, terra firma? Uh, how do they make a compromise? And compromise is sort of a difficult word nowadays. I think if you go to um, uh, Washington, D.C., I don't think they know what the word compromise is anymore. But fortunately, the uh, level heads at the conservative movement were able to uh, balance these uh, conflicting views. And they developed a consensus um, 
by agreement, by uh, compromising both Rabbi Dorf and Nevin's views and agreeing on most major policies. And this was approved by the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards of the Rabbinic Assembly on May 13th, 2020. And uh, this was by a vote of 22 to zero with three abstentions. So it was pretty unanimous uh, decisions. And they, uh, they produced five um, Pesach Din or rulings of law um, that I'll just uh, go over and end on this, this subject. Um, first, equal access to medical care is a moral and halachic imperative. Triage decisions must not, must not be based on criteria other than the best chance to save, um, to save lives. Secondly, scarce resources um, used to prevent infections such as personal protective equipment and vaccines may be assigned on a priority basis to medical professionals and other emergency responders in order to support them in their life-saving efforts. Thirdly, Jewish law uh, differentiates between respite and recovery. Scarce medical resources may be directed toward patients who are expected with this therapy to, therapy to recover over the, those who are not expected to recover even with this therapy. Diagnostic tools may be used to prioritize allocation of scarce medical resources towards patients who may be rescued and away from those not expected to survive to hospital discharge. Fourthly, if a patient is already receiving medical therapy and is responding, they may not be removed from the equipment prematurely in order to rescue the life of another person based on comparison of the patient's age, ability, general health, or social status. Removing a patient from therapy is determination that, cannot, uh, that the person cannot survive to discharge or only by their own request to shift to palliative care. And finally, the tree, if the triage officer determines that a patient cannot be saved and that their medical resources must be reallocated to another patient in urgent need, the basis for this decision must be explained fully and sensitively to the patient or their representative. And the hospital must continue to support the patient with appropriate palliative and pastoral care, maintaining the respect and dignity of the patient until the end. So that's um, the uh, current ethical dilemmas that we have in, in uh, triaging, rationing, and reallocating. I think uh, the COVID river keeps flowing onward and there's been a lot of rocks and bumps in the road. Um, we, have, we don't know where it's gonna end. We don't know what the outcomes are gonna be. We know that there's gonna be still difficult decisions to be made. Um, we have to have some good eyes on what's going on. I'm not sure these birds are the, the best eyes that we have, but I'm not sure some of our, uh, our leadership is um, also in, in looking at this in the proper perspective. And we need to follow science and uh, epidemiology um, in the best way we can to decide how we're gonna allocate these limited resources over the course of time. So on that note, I will stop. If there is anything in the chat, let me go here. I think we're back on the uh, screen now. And let's see what we got in the chat room. Can we ask questions interactively? Absolutely. Uh, we'll open it for questions a little later. On your standards of care slide, aren't there exceptions such as when there is not a crisis of resources but certain groups do not receive a consistent level of care as other groups. Um, yes, um, these uh, standards of care under um, crisis are a little bit different, um, but there still may be limited resources uh, when there is not standards of care, and they actually have to have um, uh, certain uh, um, uh, protocols in place to determine what what allocation can be made. For example, uh, transplants would be a good example, perhaps. We don't have an unlimited amount of transplants of kidneys, lungs, hearts, or other organs. So you have to be some rules um, to, to guide this. 
Um, and then as far as consistent level of care, uh, clearly there is a difference in economic groups. Uh, people in rural areas, people in underserved areas do not have uh, the same access to care. And we're seeing this in some of the, in the numbers of people who are coming down with, uh, with COVID over the course of time. So there is, there is uh, an inconsistent level of care in other groups at this, at this uh, stage. Um, and uh, the, the issue about Blacks and Hispanics are what I just, what I just uh, mentioned. Uh, insurance would also uh, uh, perhaps uh, affect uh, uh, who gets the care also. Uh, yeah, instrumental value, including those who clean the hospital and feed the patients. Interesting. I've not read anything specifically about that. Um, I, I think I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't put it this way, perhaps, but uh, it's harder to replace a critical care nurse or doctor or first responder than it is to be a, to keep to replace a health cleaner. So there is a potential conflict on inst instrument, instrumental value. Who, who really is instrumental in keeping things going? Um, if you can't have uh, enough resources in a hospital to keep the hospital clean and functioning, then those people um, uh, are as important as the nurse or doctor who is taking care of the patient because the spread of the infection in the hospital could be worse. If you don't have a pharmacist who can um, get get the materials, the medications out to the patients, then uh, you have problems acquiring medications. So it's, again, it's an ethical decision that you have to think about when you're looking at instrumental value. Um, any, anybody else have questions or comments? Please feel free. Uh, you don't count, Marty. You're, 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 you're <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just wanted to find out. I'm, Going all the way back to Vietnam War, I'm just surprised that the military hasn't been prepared for something like this. They do teach uh, chemical warfare, biological warfare. They really don't appear since that point to have been prepared for anything like we're facing. That's just uh, an aside. But, but what I really wanted to address with you, if we can chunk this problem up a little bit, you make a math model up, and in that you put all of your uh, desires and your limitations and all that, turn the crank and the computer will, will spit out uh, what it has to. And it's easy to tweak that model and, and make it lean in certain directions. So I don't even want to go in that direction. But at what level should the math modeling be done? Should it be at the national level? Uh, should it be at a state level? Should it be at a county or city level? what level would you want to do this modeling so that you can optimize either the number of patients saved or the number of patient years saved, whatever your criteria are? At what level do you want to want to chunk that? And I guess maybe if we just limit it to uh, things like the PPE, I'm not even talking about lives. Is there a, an optimal purchasing level that we should be considering as a country or as a state? or as a city, at what level do we really hit the best, the best bang for the buck? And then in terms of people's lives, uh, how do you want to model that one? Is that also national, state, or, or regional? Um, for, first, let me just make a comment about the military. Um, there are publications um, and um, manuals for all sorts of disasters and crises exist. Um, the military is more concerned about terrorism, uh, nuclear warfare, uh, biological warfare, and so on. Um, and, and they emphasize uh, that perspective. And, and, and I do have a, a military manual here that uh, I'd be happy to ship to you at your expense uh, for uh, review. Um, so th there, there, is th there are things that uh, uh, exist. Um, regarding, you know, where, what level should this be done at? I, I, I have a personal opinion about this, and I try not to bias the talk by, by introducing my, my opinions, but I think um, it makes sense that we should know where resources are. Um, let me just take the state of Colorado. It would be really helpful if we know where all the hospitals are, 
where all the hospital beds are, where all the ICU beds are, where um, all the critical care doctors and nurses are, where all the specific medications, where all the personal protective equipment is. And we should be able to allocate to each area of the state everything that they need to, do, to be available under the standards of care. So each individual hospital, institution, uh, medical center should have what they need to um, um, uh, undertake their day-to-day -day, um, uh, processes, uh, the, their care of patients. And then you should know where the excess resources are. So you can move them around properly when there's a need, when there's a scarcity of, of resources. Obviously, with certain things, you may want to have them closer to a bigger city because that's where the cases are going to appear first and in greatest numbers. But you need to know where those resources are. As we've seen in, in, in COVID, the big cities are, are affected first and rural areas have been, become affected later. So you need those resources, you need to know where they are, you need to be able to move them properly. I doubt very much that this is going to be uh, done on a federal level. Um, uh, they may have some resources available, but getting it moved around to places that they're most needed, I think is going to end up being more of a political problem than it is going to be a medical issue in that regard. Um, I don't know uh, what different states have in terms of uh, knowing where their resources are right now. I think, I think some do, um, uh, and some are better at it than others. Uh, New York State may have been an example because they uh, had the opportunity to move things around and, and locate where their resources are, uh, but it's not going to be done on a national level, but I think it does, it, it does apply to all the resources in COVID epidemic or pandemic, but also should we apply to any kind of disaster, you know, national disaster. You're more likely to have a, a tornado and hurricanes on the east and the southeast, not likely to have those type of things, or well, maybe tornadoes, but not hurricanes in Colorado. Um, fires, same thing there. Um, nuclear disasters. You know, where are the nuclear reactors? That's where you want your iodine supplies, perhaps. So there's a, there's, there's, you have to tweak this in different ways um, to make it most effective. Anything else? I was okay, well, just... Doctor, I want to thank you so much for your time. You, you uh, prepared excellently and presented superbly. And I thank you so much for doing that. I thank you all the participants. I am uh, sending a chat. Uh, if you'd like to give a donation in, in honor of Dr. Uh, Weinstein, there is a place there for to do so. And uh, I was very informative, very interesting. I can't thank you enough. I can't thank the uh, participants enough. Thank you so much. One and all. And thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you. Alan, thank Alan, thank you for organizing. Very nice. Thank very you. Nice. Thank you. Very Have a good fascinating. night. Fascinating. Thank you. Very thank fascinating. You. Thank you. This was excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Hey, everybody. Great job.